The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Taking a New Look at Parago Nodularis. How is emerging evidence regarding disease pathophysiology and treatment influencing patient care? Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash ZXX860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Good morning. Welcome to taking a new look at Parigo nodularis. How, how is emerging evidence regarding disease pathophysiology and treatment influencing patient care? So we will be talking quite a bit about the uh, pathophysiology and new data with regard to Parigo nodularis and how this is actually fundamentally informing our understanding of the disease. So our panelists today will be uh, Dr. Sarah Chisholm and myself, uh, Brian Kim. So I'll be starting with uh, talking about paragonodularis pathophysiology and just the presentation. Uh, so really kind of what is it? Uh, again, my name is Brian Kim. I'm actually at uh, Mount Sinai. Uh, and uh, a, a primary focus of, of what I do is actually the science behind itch and conditions like paragonodularis. So uh, happy to speak to any of the, uh, the emerging science. So paragonodularis is a distinct clinical disease defined by the presence of uh, pruritic uh, nodules that can be uh, generalized, elevated, firm, uh, and uh, even ulcerated at times. And a point that I like to make about paragonodularis is that it's not re really, in my view, an inflammatory skin disorder. It is a pruritic skin disorder that manifests with inflammatory lesions. And that, that is why anti-inflammatory agents, as we'll speak to in a bit, uh, have efficacy potentially for this condition, but it is a truly pruritic condition. Uh, very little is known about this, and I think my prediction is we're going to actually find that the prevalence is much higher than what it's estimated at. It's less than about 200,000. Uh, conditions like PN, in my, in my opinion, are grossly underestimated because the patients are uh, so uh, in a sense, uh, frustrated and disenfranchised. So they don't actually end up on the uh, data um, in, in the way that, for instance, uh, um, there's unemployment data where workers are trying to find jobs and they're unemployed, and then there are workers that just don't enter into the unemployment data. That's where I actually put these patients. Um, the estimated prevalence of PN in the United States stratified by age, uh, I won't get into this. Again, disclaimer, I will say is I think these data are actually also very flawed because when we talk about coding, coding for PN I don't think is going to be very good. I, I see all I see is chronic edge patients and the coding is all over the place. But notwithstanding that, uh, understanding that we do can glean a little bit about this and we know that the average age of patients for P, with PN tends to be a little bit higher. Um, and we'll have some great cases here today as well um, of patients with PN. So um, when we're talking about the pathogenesis of PN, uh, we're talking about uh, the interplay between the nervous system and the immune system, as well as the uh, epithelial barrier itself. So as I mentioned, we think of uh, this as a primary itch condition. So for whatever reason, your peripheral sensory nervous system is feeling the need uh, the sensation uh, of itch and that one has to scratch. If you start scratching, what happens is that uh, you induce a defect in the skin barrier. And there are uh, very evolutionarily conserved pathways within the skin that when you breach the barrier, it will react in a particular way. So in other words, when you breach the barrier, you will not get spontaneously developed psoriasis. What you will start to develop, though, is uh, immunologically elements of what we describe as type 2 inflammation. So you'll start to actually activate uh, specific pathways, cytokines like IL-4, IL-13, IL-31, uh, IL-33 from the, that comes from the barrier, TSLP. Uh, there are other cytokines involved. So now you set off this cascade of inflammation. You activate other stromal cells, fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and whatnot. But... Uh, and it can get a, a bit messy, and as you start to break the barrier and get ulcerations, but then a lot of this inflammation now feeds back into the nervous system. So it's not just a primary 
desire to scratch. Now you're getting other elements coming in and it's really how we uh, disrupt this kind of itch scratch cycle. The other point I wanna make is that when you itch, starts in the skin, goes through your peripheral nervous system, goes through your spinal cord, it will get to your brain and you'll perceive itch. But itch is also a reflex, so it doesn't have to get to the brain for you to necessarily uh, uh, scratch either. So it can, and this is essentially why you are scratching uh, when you sleep and why patients wake up and say, I have bloody sheets. So the perception of itch is incredibly debilitating, but you don't need to be um, necessarily conscious of it. Okay, so we're gonna play a video here. Parigo nodularis, or PN, is a distinct chronic neural and immune-mediated skin disease characterized by intense itch and nodular lesions. As one of the itchiest skin conditions, PN is characterized by the development of a pathological itch scratch cycle and neuronal sensitization leading to disease chronicity independent of the initial disease triggers. Histological examination of PN lesional skin demonstrates dense infiltrates of eosinophils, T lymphocytes, and mast cells which release a wide range of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Eosinophils accumulate in the dermis of PN lesions releasing the neuropeptides nerve growth factor and substance P, and exacerbate neurogenic pathways. Eosinophil cationic protein and eosinophil-derived neurotoxin eosinophil protein X, the granular pro-inflammatory components of eosinophil cells, are also upregulated in the upper dermis of PN lesions. Interleukin-4 and vasoactive intestinal polypeptide are additional eosinophilic contributors of PN pathogenesis. These pro-inflammatory and pro-fibrogenic cytokines induce pruritus and erythema of the lesions. T lymphocytes play an important role in pathogenesis through the release of interleukin-31 at the lesion sites. Increased IL-31 expression is strongly associated with itch and a wide range of pruritic skin diseases, with the relative highest expression found in the lesional skin of PN patients. Along with eosinophils and T lymphocytes, mast cells also help maintain the inflammatory response in PN, releasing histamine, prostaglandins, and other itch-mediating substances. Increased expression of the neuropeptide substance P and calcitonin gene-related peptide, neurotrophins such as nerve growth factor and endothelin support the notion of dysregulated neuroimmune epithelial crosstalk also explaining the neuronal and epidermal hyperplasia of skin in patients with PN. In summary, though the exact pathogenesis of PN is unclear, it appears that increased activity of type 2 immune cells and cytokines, along with certain other immune cells and inflammatory mediators, may contribute to signs and symptoms of PN through interactions with neurons and other dermal and epidermal resident cells. In line with a central role of Th2 cytokines, therapies targeting IL-4, IL-13, and IL-31 are in development and have demonstrated short and long-term efficacy in treating paragonodularis, offering new hope for improved patient care. So one of the interesting things about PN is that uh, the, the lesions are quite dramatic. And uh, I, I was actually giving a talk yesterday and to a group that was actually not familiar with, with PN and people were Googling it and they said it's quite dramatic, you know, what, what they actually see in it. And histologically, we see that too. We see tremendous amount of hyperkeratosis, acanthosis, and, um, and inflammation. Uh, you would almost think that this was actually just a primary um, uh, inflammatory dermatosis. So I think one of the things we have to also kind of keep in, in our minds, at least, uh, is it, when you think about itch, why, why do we de develop, why does one develop a PN lesion? Many patients itch, but all I see is patients with chronic itch, but not everyone develops PN. So something has gone awry. Um, just, I think, as we think about the pathophysiology, it's good to think about that. And then the uh, core symptoms of clinical presentation, uh, many of us are quite familiar with this, but just to kind of codify this, the, you know, the presence of these kind of firm nodular lesions, pruritus lasting greater than or equal to six weeks, but that's just because that's how we define chronic pruritus in general, uh, and this kind of history of signs of repeated scratching, picking, uh, and rubbing. 
Um, additional features is that they generally should be symmetrically distributed within accessible areas that one can reach. So the idea is that if these patients could not scratch, they uh, theoretically would not develop these lesions. Um, so uh, additionally, some interesting things is that the, the, the face, the palms, uh, the soles, scalp, and genitals are generally not affected. Um, so this distinguishes it from some other chronic itch conditions. Um, and then uh, the lesions can be characterized by, uh, we spoke about the in, in, uh, very kind of, um, kind of fibrotic looking, uh, lichenified plaques and excoriations, uh, uh, ulcerations and scars uh, left over from this. Um, the pruritus itself can also be associated due to the breakdown of the skin with uh, burning, stinging, pain and other sensations. So more specific uh, sensory apathies um, beyond just itch. So we'll play another uh, patient video here. Uh, well, I've always itched and it's, my grandmother couldn't stand it. She'd say, why are you always scratching? I'm like, I don't know. My father thought I was allergic to something whenever I'd go visit my grandparents because he was in the service. So he didn't notice that I itched all the time, you know, but um, I've always itched. I think since I was at least eight, um, I didn't realize I was getting spots or the Perigo, is that how you say it? The perigo, probably until like a junior high, middle school, because our uh, middle school had swim class, and I was like, uh, you know, I always kind of considered them freckles when I was younger, but as I got older and they would get harder, it was like, um, okay, this is not quite right. And uh, again, you, you know, you're 12, 13, that's when you're starting to notice changes in your body and uh I, you know it, i would be a bit self-conscious about swim class or gym class and you know wearing shorts and stuff like that so so yeah around preteen. well the nodule is a dark hard spot or hardened spot um and yes if you scratch them they're going to bleed they will bleed they will they might puss up so yeah they will bleed they will spot up um, I think we've counted up to 20 on each arm sometimes. And again, we only count the ones that are hard, that have scarred over, I guess you would say. So um, if they do ever soften up, and I think we were successful in getting them softened uh, with one dermatologist, some sort of cortisone shot that he would actually do into the nodule and you would get it to soften up. But because of the scarring, the scarring seemed to stay, the, the, the dark, scar. I do not wear short sleeves. I don't wear tank tops. I, I don't wear halters. Um, I am usually in the summertime I'll have on leggings. You know, I'm not going to be in shorts or mini skirts or anything like that because it's also on my legs. So, and that's just been a forever thing. So I've gotten used to it. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where you don't miss what you never had. So yes, yes. Sometimes it is warm and I'm like, oh, I wish I could wear shorts or tank top, but then my skin would burn. And when the sun hits my skin, it kind of burns it anyway, because it's so sensitive and I've probably put so many chemicals on it. And now uh, here we have uh, clinical pictures of uh, different presentations of the pages of PN. And this is what I meant by uh, when one Googles it, uh, it's quite dramatic in terms of what they see. Um, the, uh, Impact and quality of life with PN, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, uh, as one would imagine, uh, there's a disruption of sleep, uh, there's uh, psychosocial dis disturbances, and of course, mood disorders that are associated with it. For me, I've been struck by how, even in contrast to the atopic dermatitis patients, how uh, d depressed in terms of the affect a lot of these patients are. Um, but there's a whole host of, of, of uh, comorbidities uh, that come with this. And, we have another patient video here. Now the itch of perigo is like an itch you've never felt. It is a neural itch. It is like an electrical shock coming from the inside out. It is so uncomfortable that it overtakes every thought in your mind. Um, I, and I can't really describe it any other way. I lived life as a zombie. 
my only success in life was getting through my workday and coming home and going to sleep. Um, Paragonodularis affected every aspect of my life. It bugged my family that I was scratching all the time and why couldn't I stop scratching and that I needed to stop scratching. And so I would isolate myself. Um, I could not travel. I had open sores all over my body. I would bloody my bed every single night. Um, it was, it was horrible. I, I think you're hearing ex exactly kind of uh, what happens when uh, patients suffer from this in terms of all the, the, the social isolation, but also, um, uh, I also want to just mention that yeah, there are um, other kinds of uh, diseases that uh, result in pruritus and that can actually uh, also be um, associated with pregonodularis. And one is at atopic dermatitis. Uh, we know that lots of patients with atopic dermatitis will have parigo manifestations, but there are also a whole host of systemic uh, diseases as well. And we'll speak a little bit, hopefully, more about that later in the Q&A as well. Um, the relationship, however, is unclear um, as to how these different diseases intersect with parigo. Um, in terms of, uh, this is just a kind of um, mean kind of quality of life impact. You, this is just to show that parigo is actually um, ahead of a number of different uh, conditions, uh, even stroke uh, and, and diabetes and such. So it is a, it is a very high, highly morbid uh, condition. Uh, the economic burden of PN is uh, thought to be uh, quite dramatic. Um, the uh, estimated individual lifetime burden for a patient uh, thought to be on the order of $300,000. Um, the uh, societal burden uh, in the United States is approaching $40 billion. Um, it, as a benchmark, the, uh, the NIH budget is about $30 billion <laughs> annually for all research. So. Uh, and then the um, and then and then we have the uh, um, uh, we, and so th there's a whole host of uh, that there's a cost, but also the um, the impact overall on the patient's uh, quality of life. But also in terms of the differential diagnosis, um, I, I, you know we tend to recognize it when we see it. Um, but you know there's atopic dermatitis. There's um, there's perforating disorders associated with uh, dialysis. Um, there's a, a uh, lichen simplex chronica, certainly, and lichen planus. And uh, I'm not going to go through the whole list, but there are a number of other things we have to consider. But in general, I think that it, it tends to not be so much of a diagnostic uh, dilemma. It tends to be uh, a little bit more of a treatment demo, dilemma, what doc, uh, Dr. Chisholm will speak to. Um, in terms of clinical exam, I don't like to get overly uh, burdened with this. Uh, we recognize it, but then we want to get a sense of what's the severity, the extent of the PN, the paritis intensity, uh, the disease burden, how is this actually affecting the patient, but they'll, they'll usually tell you. Um, and then assess the need for kind of what kind of behavioral or emotional support these uh, patients need. Um, I don't think treating their primary mood disorder is the solution, but it is something that we have to do at times when the patients are incredibly debilitated by it. Um, CBC, LFTs, renal function, these tend to actually not be that informative. We do it just to make sure we're not missing something obvious. Uh, we could also get uh, a good review of systems, thyroid function tests. Again, these tend to be pretty low yield for me, but we just don't want to miss something in t uh, totally obvious. Diabetes assessment, uh, diabetes can be associated with this. You would, of course, treat the diabetes, but that's not going to be the primary approach to treat uh, Parega nodularis. Uh, and um, HIV and hepatitis serologists as well. Again, associations don't want to not treat these things, but they're not going to reverse the PN. Uh, other things to uh, consider are um, uh, malignancy workup in the background if you're concerned with a higher index of suspicion. Uh, you don't have to go crazy uh, and do PAN scans, but... Um, and additionally, a skin biopsy as well. Uh, it never hurts to do a skin biopsy, in my opinion. Okay, so Dr. Chisholm is going to take over and uh, speak much more to management and, and outcomes and treatment. All right, thanks so much, Brian. That was that was really informative, and I, I get the hard part, which currently is is is, is treatment. Uh, although um, lots of things are changing, so we're hopeful for that 
going forward in the future. Uh, my name is Sarah Chisholm. I'm at Emory University. I, um, my foci in dermatology are atopic dermatitis, uh, allergic contact dermatitis, and itch kind of in all its forms, including parago nodularis. Thank you so much to Peerview for having us here today. So first we'll talk about kind of what are the goals of treatment in parago nodularis. Um, so first and foremost, you of course want to reduce the, the pruritus itself. Um, you know, a lot of people will wonder, is it more important to patients to improve the pruritus or to improve the appearance of the lesions? And to me, this is an and question, not an or question. A lot of times patients will be so distracted by the, the itch initially that they can't even think about the appearance of the lesions, but that will shift relatively quickly as their itch improves. Other patients, um, even initially, will be it, sometimes even more bothered or sort of equally bothered by the appearance um, just because it has such a social cost and things like that. Um, the hope is that as you treat the itch, you'll interrupt the itch scratch cycle and completely heal the, heal the parago nodularis lesions. Now, one real caveat here is that, you know, I think that Yes, interrupting the itch scratch cycle can be helpful. Um, and we know that if you do things like unaboots where you're occluding the skin, a lot of times the lesions will spontaneously heal. Uh, but I think that can have a slight implication that this, this is, quote unquote, the patient's fault. And there are certainly lesions that won't improve um, simply with occlusion and avoiding scratching. So I think that ultimately we need to move beyond that model to some extent and get treatments that intervene on both um, without just re reducing mechanical stimulation. So, um, you know, this, th there's always the part of the talk where you say, I'm going to talk about things off-label. We're going to talk about a lot of things off-label in parago nodularis because traditionally we've had essentially nothing on-label. Um, so take everything I say with a grain of salt. You'll see there is some evidence but not a, a lot of evidence for um, all of the current treatments, I would say. And then we're going to talk about kind of what's in pipeline after we finish this section. So this is a, a paragonodularis treatment ladder based on kind of expert opinion. Um, when we put together this diagram, I would say we struggled to some extent as far as how to organize this because it is a bit messy. So please forgive us. This is the best kind of way we could think to organize it. And I, I think f for me conceptually it works quite well, but there are a couple of different things going on. So first we kind of divided the treatments into primarily intervening on the neural axis and then primarily intervening on the immunologic axis. As, as with many paritic conditions, you always have some of both. Um, it can be hard to tell which one to start with. Um, we try to tease out kind of which one is the primary driver in patients and hopefully we'll begin to understand that more fully over time. Um, but to some extent now it's a gestalt kind of which side of this do you start on? And then from top to bottom, there are a couple different things going on as well. So we tried to start with kind of less invasive treatments at the bottom and work our way up to more invasive and also kind of mixed in there is um, a progression from a little bit more evidence to less evidence with the with again the caveat being there's not a ton of evidence for any of these so we'll kind of work our way through these tiers um, in the mainly topical tier one um, on the neural side you have a couple different things topical capsaicin which you know anecdotally among people who treat a lot of parago nodularis actually does work quite well but it's very difficult for patients to tolerate especially initially as you all know so um, that's I, the, I would say the limiting factor there and then combinations of topical ke ketamine amitriptyline and lidocaine um, I say the main barrier here is that uh, you know topical lidocaine is it available commercially but um, if you start adding in the other components, you do have to get these medications compounded, which can be financially ch challenging. And I'll kind of stop repeating this, but um, the level of evidence here is some evidence, but relatively minimal, I would say. And then on the immunologic side of tier one, you have more choices, but similarly, a little bit of evidence, not a ton. You've got the calcineurin inhibitors, betamethasone valerate tape, which is actually somewhat useful because since it's embedded in a tape, um, you can avoid, to some extent, the mechanical stimulation of the areas, which um, can be helpful as well. Um, Calcipatriol, also a vitamin D analog, and then cryotherapy, either alone or in combination with injected um, triamcinolone and or lidocaine. And then kind of an 
offshoot of tier two um, in, a, in a way because we, we thought this type of therapy may intervene on kind of both axes. You have light therapy, so UVB, eczema, and then PUVA plus or minus UVB, again, with a little bit of evidence for both. On the neural side in tier two, um, there are several different options. So the gabapentinoids, um, SSRIs, amitriptyline, which we know has some an antihistaminergic properties, and then serlapatant and epipentant in different dosing and formulations. And as a side note, I'm not going to get into a lot of the dosing here because there's not a ton of evidence and because these are off-label, but we did include it for your reference, so it'll be there in the slides if you, if you would like to refer back to it. On the immunologic side for Tier 2, we've got methotrexate and cyclosporin, so sort of traditional immunosuppressive medications um, for which there is some evidence and not a huge, huge um, side effect profile, although... We know with both of these, you do have to be careful with lab monitoring and things like that. And then moving up to tier three on the neural side. So these are either less tolerable or less well established. Uh, so you've got some things that intervene on the opioid pathway as well as thalidomide, which again, um, according to expert opinion, does um, work well, but obviously has a very challenging side effect profile as well as kind of an administrative burden for prescribing. And then on the immunologic side, so again, these are either less tolerable or less well-established, so off-label at this time. Um, so you've got dupilumab at different regimens, and then azathioprine, um, which again, some people feel works quite well, but it's more challenging even than some of the other traditional immunosuppressive medications because of its side effect profile. And then um, nemalizumab as well. Tier four, things that some people think may be helpful, but um, really relatively minimal data at, at this time. So this would include the cannabinoids, which um, some people feel are quite promising, as well as immunologic. On the immunolo immunologic side, we have mecophenolate, um, which is, I would say, similar in terms of side effect profile to methotrexate, but um, it just happens to have a little less evidence associated with it, although it's kind of splitting hairs at this point. Um, JAK inhibitors also fall in this pathway, and then IL anti-IL-31 and oncostatin M receptor antibodies. And then we're going to have a, a third patient video about treatment this time. My name is Rosemary Hauser. I am a survivor of parigo nodularis. Uh, I mean that tongue in cheek in a way, but uh, it was so very impactful on my life that uh, after I was finally diagnosed and got into treatment, I really did get my life back. Now, clearly I didn't start off at 6-Benadryl, but it would be uh, the only way I could get through the day. Two before I started work, two in the middle of the day, and two uh, when I got home or in the evening. Very disappointing to hear the allergist say uh, I needed behavior modification. That was probably the most demoralizing event through the whole thing was uh, minimizing itch and making it my fault, uh, letting me know that I had total control over what was going on and that I needed to stop it. Um, and he offered nothing else. I was to the point that I was going to be asking for some pain pills just to deaden um, just to deaden those nerve endings in hopes of uh, deadening those nerve endings because it it was all consuming. It won't hurt to try. So he agreed, and it has been my lifesaver. I feel like a normal human being. My lesions are mostly gone. Uh, my discomfort is all but gone. So this is just to summarize. This is not my patient, but I definitely have uh, multiple patients like this. Um, situations in which they've been through lots and lots of different treatments and it can be it can be frustrating it can be challenging often they won't be 
particularly enthusiastic about trying new things because they've been through so many things already. And they certainly have frustrations with the idea of revisiting things, if, even if they were inadequately dosed and things like that. So it's definitely a challenge at this point in time. Fortunately, um, to turn to the positive, we have a lot of things in pipeline right now, which we're very excited about. So we have, I'll just go through these briefly. We've got dupilumab, um, which is IL-4 receptor alpha antagonist, as you know, nemalizumab, which is an IL-31 inhibitor, a couple of different JAK inhibitors, um, vixarelumab, which is an OSMR beta inhibitor, and then nalbufene, which is uh, works on the opioid pathway. And then we're just going to get into, just scratch the surface of this. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a large pipeline, which we're very, very grateful for. These patients have had um, a very frustrating treatment experience in, in the past, I would say. So I'm grateful that there's some work being done in this area, and it's uh, to, to some extent beyond the scope of this presentation. So just keep your ears and eyes open, because I think there will be a lot more to come in this space. Um, but we'll just touch on a couple of... Um, new items in the um, in the evidence that has come out recently. So we'll look at dupilumab first, the Liberty PN clinical program. These were randomized phase three double-blind placebo-controlled trials evaluating the efficacy and safety of dupilumab in adults with a pretty wide age range, which is important, I think, because um, this, this disease can disproportionately affect older individuals. Um, they had paragonodularis that was either inadequately controlled with pr topical prescription therapies or for whom those therapies are not advisable. It was a 24-week trial, and patients received, of course, either dupilumab or placebo every two weeks, plus or minus topical treatments. So in this trial, they were able to maintain on topical treatments if they, certain topical treatments if they were using those at the time of randomization. Um, so comparing dupilumab to placebo at week 24, 60% of the dupilumab patients versus 18% of the placebo patients did achieve the primary endpoint, which was clinically meaningful reduction in itch from baseline. And then 48% of the dupilumab patients versus 18% in the placebo group achieved the secondary endpoint, which was clear, almost clear skin, so looking at the resolution of those nodules. Um, additionally, dupilumab patients experienced significantly greater improvements in measures of overall health-related quality of life in skin pain and symptoms of anxiety and depression. Um, we're starting to get more and more trials that are looking at these um, kind of quality of life and patient-reported outcomes, which in paritic conditions I think is really important. Um, adverse event rates were similar between groups, so 57% in dupilumab group and 51% in placebo. Um, and as you're probably kind of familiar with um, from the atopic dermatitis data, HSV infections were more common with, with dupilumab at 7% versus placebo. So that's relatively similar to the AD data. And then there were actually lower rates of skin infections overall associated with treatment in the dupilumab group, um, so 5% versus 9%. Um, we speculate that that may be because there were fewer breaks in the skin, so the skin's protecting itself better, but we don't really know that yet. Um, dis discontinuations before week 24 were considerably lower in the dupilumab group. Um, in Prime 2, just as an example, this was, a, I think, a pretty well-balanced uh, group. Um, so the average age was 49 years, so presumably a pretty um, significant spread across that 18 to 80 age range. 64% were women, which is um, somewhat consistent with the paragonodularis data we have in general. And then about a third self-identified as Asian, 13% Latino Hispanic, and 5% Black. 46% um, had at least one coexisting type 2 inflammatory disease, and I think this is important because it's, um, it, it's representative of both patients who have paragonodularis in the setting of other atopic diseases and then ones who have it in isolation from other atopic diseases, so um, we're able to view it in both those populations. About 24% had prior use of systemic immunosuppressants, and 11% had been treated with antidepressants, so a good mix of patients who had had pretty significant systemic intervention in the past. We've got some late-breaking data from the Phase 3 Prime 2 trial. I'll go through this um, sort of quickly. Um, the, about 30 
7% at week 12, so the halfway point, experienced a clinically meaningful reduction in itch from baseline versus 22% in the placebo group. And then at week 24, um, again, pretty comparable to the other prime trial, so 58% um, reached the endpoint in dipilumab patients versus 20% in the, in the placebo group. Um, and then um, skin clearance, also comparable. Side effects, adverse events were also comparable. So uh, based on these results, a supplemental biologics license application was accepted for priority review in May of this year, and the target FDA decision date is in September. So um, to be continued, stay posted. And if approved, dupilumab would be the first drug with a PN-specific indication. However, it may not be for long. There, as I said, there are lots of things that are quickly changing in this space. So we're going to look briefly at um, nemolizumab and paragonodularis as well. So these are um, some of the results from the phase two trial, which was moderate to severe disease. And you can see here from the graph, um, nemolizumab resulted in a greater reduction in pruritus and severity of skin lesions than placebo in patients with paragonodularis, although you did see some side effects, including abdominal and nonspecific musculoskeletal symptoms. Um, so you'll see the 57.9% change from baseline and the peak pruritus sc score in the nemolizumab group versus 26.1 in the placebo group. And then fairly late-breaking results here, too. So we actually have some phase three data on nemolizumab um, that's, that's quite recent. This is the Olympia II trial. This was a 16-week randomized control trial evaluating efficacy, safety, pharmacokinetics, and immunogenicity of monotherapy. So in this trial, by contrast, um, patients were not allowed to use other topical treatments. That may be a minor difference, but important to keep in mind. Um, here you have 38% of the nemolizumab-treated patients versus 11% in the placebo arm who reached clearance or near clearance of skin lesions, and 56% of the nemolizumab-treated patients versus 21% in the placebo arm achieved at least a four-point reduction in itch, which is considered cl clinically significant. Olympia II also met all key secondary, secondary endpoints, and the safety profile was consistent with the phase two result that we already talked about. Um, Olympia I is still ongoing, so we'll look out for those results in the near future, hopefully. And then we'll move on to a couple of cases. And I wanted to mention, too, um, just as a reflection of how quickly this space is changing. So we have the new nemolizumab data, and there's also some very, very new data that came out actually after we completed and had our slides approved for nalbufine, which is an oral medication that acts on the opioid axis. So this space is really changing even more quickly than we're really able to update our presentations. So do stay tuned. Uh, we're very excited about kind of all of the above. I think it's a great service to patients um, because it's been a very frustrating to disease to treat and a frustrating disease for patients to date. Um, so this is a patient of mine. This is a new patient who presented with an eight-year history of paragonodularis and a 13-year history of chronic kidney disease, which at this point is stage five. Um, so you certainly will see paragonodularis in isolation, but as you all know, you'll also see it in conjunction with a lot of other disease processes. Um, this is not well, well understood, um, but definitely makes it more challenging to treat. Um, she was on dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and describes severe pruritus at least eight eight out of ten, eight to ten out of ten, um, kind of, it, it's a confusing history. Um, she would sometimes report it as unrelenting all the time, and then sometimes report it as worse during and immediately after dialysis sessions. So it was a little difficult to pin down, is it something from the dialysis state? There's probably some baseline level, so a lot going on there. Um, she's had a negative workup for other potential systemic causes of pruritus, but we know certainly her chronic kidney disease is, is a major contributor. She, similarly to the video patient, she had had many previous treatments, um, multiple antihistamines, which were marginally helpful per the patient, gabapentin, which she said, interestingly, was not helpful at all, um, unknown dosing, but she just had had it with that and did not want to go back, um, naloxone, which she also said was not helpful at all, multiple topical agents, including triamcinolone and topical lidocaine, um, 
did nothing again, did not want to revisit. Um, and also had had dupilumab. She took it for two to three months and according to her experienced worsening, which was interesting, although the chart did note improvement in lesion appearance and qu quantity. So this is one of the complexities of phragonodularis is it is a patient directed um, disease process ultimately in that it's a quality of life issue. So we really have to rely on what they say, but there's also a visible component. So sort of which of those do you take as the primary indicator? And I think you have to really consider both. Um, so again, you know, to date in paragonodularis treatment, I've been pretty patient directed and um, taken their input into consideration quite a bit. So if a patient feels any histamines are helpful, or at least give them some minimal baseline level of control, even if it doesn't make as much sense pathophysiologically, I will allow them to continue. Although you, of course, have to be wary of high doses of sedating antihistamines, um, particularly in older older individuals, which this patient is. Um, phototherapy, um, again, can be very efficacious, but you have to think about the practical aspects. So, for example, this patient is at dialysis Monday, Wednesday, Friday. To ask her to come in two more times a week or three more times a week is just um, kind of overly burdensome for a lot of patients. Um, enrollment in a clinical trial um, certainly can be an option, but very difficult, as you know, in a lot of patients who have comorbidities like chronic kidney disease, so they can get excluded from trials. This is starting to change to some extent, but definitely a barrier. Um, and also the, you know, the ongoing dialysis can be a barrier as well. And then pregabalin didn't seem to make a lot of sense because she had already been on gabapentin and that hadn't worked for her. Um, I presented her actually with even some additional options beyond this, so dronabinol, cannabinoid, um, Nerovan, UVB, again, a, a bit of a barrier because of scheduling. And then I offered to communicate with her nephrologist to try to investigate the dialysate contents that, in my experience, has been really frustrating and not, uh, I've never, I don't think I've ever successfully figured it out. And then we also considered diphelicephalin, which is kappa opioid receptor antagonist, um, which is approved for use in dialysis patients at this point is only IV at this point. And then ultimately, um, kind of strangely, we did end up using pregabalin mainly because the patient wanted to try it. And currently she's pretty happy with a regimen of 50 milligrams a day, as well as an additional 100 milligrams immediately after each dialysis session. Um, again, a little bit of a confusing history. She still reports itch severity of 7 out of 10 at some times, particularly during and after dialysis, but reports that it resolves pretty quickly when she starts using the pregabalin. Um, the nodules show slight improvement, underwhelming, I would say. Um, so, you know, at this point when we have some new therapies um, that are on the verge of coming out, uh, but we're also working with kind of our traditional off-label algorithm. I am, am very patient-centered in my practice in general, so I, I still kind of let the patient guide um, how aggressive they want to be and um, what options they're open to, which I think you're kind of, in a way, almost forced to be with paragonodularis because they tend to be frustrated with a lot of things when they get to you. Uh, but I also, you know, keep kind of laying the groundwork of we have some more things coming. Um, we may have some things that are approved, so you may want to reconsider. And I keep revisiting that conversation um, because I think it's important to kind of continue to let them have all available options. And then I'll turn, now I'll turn it over to okay. you. Okay. So, um, yeah, thank you, Dr. Chisholm. Uh, I'll, I'll present a patient of mine who's a 55-year-old uh, man with uh, peridic papula nodules, depression, um, and obesity, and uh, it, this is a uh, hit a three-year history of this. Um, and I, I note the depression because um, uh, of the fact that it was just it was a big part of his kind of affect. Uh, he was very disengaged from his daily activities. His numerical rating scale at score is ten out of ten. Uh, would uh, have trouble sleeping. Woke up with bloody sheets. This is a common. I feel like it's kind of a, a common buzz term that you hear is that I wake up with uh, blood on my sheets. Uh, I think it's partly because it's quite disturbing to patients and because um, uh, they, they're not even aware of what's actually happening half the time in their lives. And uh, it was actually heavily affecting his work uh, and at home. He's actually having marital problems. Uh, it was not exercising and, 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 and gaining weight. Um, had failed us very similarly to the the other case antihistamines in this case the uh, gabapentinoids did not do anything 
uh, uh, phototherapy did not help. Uh, response to treatment really had been minimal. Maybe there were, maybe phototherapy took a little bit of edge off, but really has, was having no um, substantive effect on the disease. Uh, the the reality is there's actually no right answer. <laughs> Uh, but, uh, so this was a number of years ago. So I tried cyclosporin, uh, no response. I tried, uh, mycophenolate, no response. Uh, tried azathioprine, uh, minimal response, uh, with, uh, reductions, uh, in itching nodules to some degree, but this was not dramatic. It was just enough to kind of, I guess, keep him, uh, hopeful that uh, things could get better. Um. So n now what would you do for this patient? Would you give them a cannabinoid? Um, uh, would you give the, uh, him an antidepressant, uh, dupilumab, or, or completely give up? Uh, I'd say that, um, as I mentioned before, I, I'm not against giving an antidepressant at all. I, I just don't think it's treating the primary process. Um, so I think that people get confused sometimes. Um, and I think that uh, you know, we saw the case of behavioral modification, sure, fine, but it's, it's not the primary process. And I think we have to be very clear to patients, if we're going to think, do things that don't target the primary process, why? I think we have to be very transparent about that. If we conflate that the primary process is a secondary process, I think that that's what happens. Patients get insulted and they get upset, uh, and appropriately so. Um, so in this case, the patient was treated with dupilumab. Uh, the itch responded fairly quickly um, uh, within a month or so, and the nodules took actually uh, months to get better, but the patient felt better right away. Uh, he immediately um, was a different person. Um, actually, I remember, at, I think the three-month visit, he had lost so much weight. Um, I was very surprised. He had started uh, doing CrossFit, very happy, uh, was a completely different person, um, I mean, an entirely different person, to the point that it brings me back to the idea, at this point, and the, now this patient, I would not even consider putting on an antidepressant, or uh, I don't think it would even be a consideration. So uh, that's how much uh, this uh, sh shifted his life. Um, the other point here is that, um, before we go here, is that all of the drugs that Dr. Chesham sh showed that are actually in development um, is that whether they were in terms of their genesis anti-inflammatory or not, 100% um, of them have peripheral neuromodulatory properties. So that, that's, that's clear cut. So in other words, a pure anti-inflammatory drug um, uh, like azathioprine or, or Celsept uh, is, is, is not is not is, is something like that is not being explored. So anything that's even in development has neuromodular property. I think that speaks to the fundamental pathophysiology of PN, that it is a primary pruritic disorder. It is certainly helpful to get after the inflammation. The other, I think, takeaway from this case for me is that we threw a lot of broad, potent anti-inflammatory agents at this patient. They were either not effective or marginally effective. It was only when dupilumab was introduced. So and now, there's two ways you can think about that. Is it the neuromodulatory aspects of dupilumab, perhaps? The other, though, is that even on the immunological axis, the targeted nature of immunologics is critically important as we get into newer therapies. So the idea that you just broadly and potently suppress the immune system is increasingly seen as counterproductive. Uh, you know, and, and so the idea that we just, uh, you know, always use the most potent uh, immunosuppressive agent, that, that I think is going to go completely uh, by the wayside. So being actually more targeted will, can get you potentially more efficacy and potency. And I think we'll see more and more of this uh, in, in future therapeutics. All right. So I'll sum up for us. So um, as you know, paragonodularis is rare, but probably not as rare as our current statistics show us. Um, it's chronic. It is inflammatory to some extent, although also largely neural, um, characterized by intense itch and pruritic nodules that substantially undermine patient function and quality of life, um, huge impact on quality of life, no FDA-approved treatments to date, um, lots of off-label treatments used, but, but limited evidence and minimal success. Um, but fortunately, again, several agents in the research pipeline um, with promising results from phase three trials of dupilumab, nemolizumab, and nalbifene. 
Um, and then optimal care should consider both, as you said, the neurologic side and the immunologic side. Um, and I think we'll learn more through the work of Brian and others. We'll and also, um, as we use these newer agents, we'll learn more about this um, mixture of the two as time goes by. And then we'll move into questions. One question we just had is, do you combine therapies from the neural and immunologic ladder to manage disease? Do you want to? Oh, sure. Go, yeah. um, I, think the sh <laughs> I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, it, it's always, that's always a, a hard question when we have a lot of treatments that you don't have much evidence for. Do you kind of throw the kitchen sink all at once or do you try different things and see what works before um, modulating your approach so you're doing it in a more scientific fashion um, so that you, you can... Uh, see which thing is actually contributing. Um, so the short answer is yes, but I think, again, I am very patient focused in my practice, so I kind of will talk to the patient about it and be like, you know, we can try one thing at a time and see what works best for you, or if you're miserable, we can kind of throw different things at it um, at the same time just to get you some relief, and then if you're doing well, kind of peel back if we can. Um, so variety of approaches, I would say, but certainly I do use both at once. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that as as I mentioned, some of these agents that are uh, are kind of two pronged, so they're not one or the other, and I I think that's why they're deriving a lot of kind of synergistic efficacy. But then you have other agents um, like difelikeflin, which I personally believe is much purely neuromodulatory, uh, which is now approved in uremic pruritus on dialysis, which probably could be used for your your patient now. We talked about it. Yeah, yeah. 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 So. Um, and would probably get it uh, covered. Uh, so the idea is that how much, we'll, we'll see, we're going to learn from the therapeutics. So the therapeutics is so targeted, we'll actually start to see how much is there a neural contribution and how much is there an immune contribution. And I think that is how we'll be able to kind of personalize. Because I think the one thing that we may perhaps didn't underscore enough is that uh, Prego is very heterogeneous. So it's you're probably going to have certain patients respond much better to neuromodulatory therapies and others a bit better to anti-inflammatory therapies that have some neuromodulatory component. So I, I think we'll we'll see. Um, it, it, it's, it'll be interesting. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point. And I think right now, again, you know, we have these two different um, kind of buckets of our treatment algorithm, but um, that's somewhat artificial in that some overlap. And I think it's also somewhat artificial in that right now, the way we're figuring out which bucket to start with is gestalt, essentially. So hopefully over time, we'll develop A, treatments that kind of cross over into both realms, as, as you um, talked about, and then B, um, possibly even some biomarkers to see which is the primary driving force in, um, in, in various patients um, who may have various comorbidities. So I think we have a good, a good question. Um, uh, so have these tr trials uh, follow these patients beyond the 24 weeks? Uh, and here we have, it says, I've, I have a patient that did well for six months on DUPI and lost response, failed many other things in the past. Uh, what class of medication would be used, uh, or, uh, either in combo or uh, discontinuing DUPI to something else, for example, a JAK inhibitor? So, and then... Another question I'll, I'll add in because are any jack are there any jack inhibitor studies yet in PN? So they're kind of the, uh, linked, I think. Yes. So yes, um, there are jack inhibitor studies coming. So eagerly await more evidence there. I think um, that's yeah. This is this is a hard one. Um, I'd be curious to see if this patient totally lost response or lost some efficacy. Um, it, I don't have a great answer. That's a, that's a hard one. I, d I think you can do either way, depending on whether you're still getting some response. You could consider adding something on adjunctively. Um, I haven't really had patients respond, um, to have a very good response, and then lose a response altogether. Have you? Um, I've had um, not so much in PN. Uh, for me, it's been they didn't respond out of the gate. Yeah. Um, and I have some loss of response under the atopic dermatitis. But I think, um, yeah, I think the idea that you would uh, escalate uh, to, say, a JAK inhibitor is very reasonable. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I certainly have lots of patients who didn't respond. Um, 
you know, in general, uh, not just PN, when they escalate to Jack and it's not a surprise that they would respond. You're, you're getting a, a bit of a more potent uh, mechanism of action there. Um, but of course, I think those studies are not as far along. They're much earlier. So the availability is going to be an issue. Yeah, and uh, I mean, I think it's important to remember, I, I don't think we have this data for paragonodularis yet, but in the atopic dermatitis studies, patients continue to get some response, uh, some improvement in response from dupilumab very late in the game. So that's a hard one. The other thing that makes this complicated, I think, is that a lot of these patients are older and have multiple comorbidities. So I think the JAK inhibitors are a really useful addition to our armamentarium, but a lot of patients have comorbidities that may make those more challenging to use. To use. So um, it's going to be just situationally dependent, I think. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So I think we'll, we'll have to see kind of, um, you know, the I guess the million dollar question is how much does nemalizumab overlap with dupilumab? Um, and the answer is we don't know, and that'll be interesting. But I, it, so one can imagine in this case, if Nemo were available, I think it's a very reasonable thing to try it. Um, I, I, it's hard to, I don't know that we can say it's redundant at all right now. What is the pathway of PN more skewed to, to towards between IL-4 and IL-13? Would tralokinumab be a consideration or is blockade of IL-4 important? Yeah, that that's, the answer to that is not, fully known yet um it's it's one that's debated does um is so in other words if trello is used in this which i will find out soon i'm sure um is uh you know is is four or 13 more important or do you really need both and um the, i mean the short answer is we don't know yeah i don't know but i just want to make sure you also yeah i don't know. know i don't i don't know i don't know either um and then here's <laughs> This is a good one. So the antidepressants for depression or itch, the latter being low dose. Um, so I think that's asking, do you, do you use, if you use antidepressants, do you use them in low dose form? Um, and then, oh, and then the second part is a, is a little bit separate. Um, I, um, I honestly don't use, we have traditionally used antidepressants for the, itch component. And I mean, I have done that in the past, but I honestly feel like I don't get a lot of, I, I don't get a huge success, at least in prior nodularis. So what I more frequently do is encourage patients, and this is tricky because you don't want to discourage them and make them feel like it's all in their head, but they do often have a large psychiatric component. So I'll encourage patients to see psychiatry also. And I'll say, you know, they have some medications that may be helpful for your itch and maybe helpful for other things as well. And then they end up using it at the more um, traditional dosing, I would say. Um, that's that's hard because, you know, as, as you all know, access to psychiatry can be, can be an issue. But in an ideal world, that's what I do. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I, like I said, I've, I, I've never been against treating patients for their other secondary issues. But I think it just to be very clear that that's what you're that's doing. That's not the yeah. problem. That, yeah. That's not the, the yeah. root of the problem. Other, there's a little bit of data that's interesting that shows that there's some overlap in the cytokine profile between itch and depression. So I think there's a lot there that we still have yet to find out about. But I think you're, um, I have the same experience as in your case where a, a lot of times if patients get better from, from their parigonodularis, their mood will shift in the same way mm -hmm. that we see with psoriasis a lot of times. Yeah. And then the second part of this question, I find a significant number of patients don't realize they are scratching. Can you address that? That's the blood on the sheets part that you were talking about. Yeah, um, I, it's a tough one to, to uh, I, I agree. And I, we, we do know, we actually have done studies. Um, we've done studies where we've, uh, it was to investigate a um, touchless technology through a collaboration at M MIT where a device can actually me measure scratching. Uh, in patients without the patient wearing anything. But in order to validate the study, we actually did um, night uh, cameras that the patient consented to. And it was really interesting, the correlation between what patients said about their itch and what they actually did when they were sleeping was very different. Um, it wasn't always, they didn't always know what they were doing uh, when, when they were sleeping. They often did, but there, there was a good chunk of the time where uh, they thought they weren't really itching at night and they were actually scratching throughout the night. Uh, which 
uh, speaks further to the fact that it's actually hard to address sometimes, um, even if uh, e- even if you see it, it you, they may not be very aware of that. And I think one of the things that's very hard as a provider is you don't really want to hammer on the, the whole saying, stop scratching. It's really hard to say that because it's actually a, a reflex. So um, it's like saying stop breathing or something. You know, you, it, when it's a reflex, they're not actually w- willfully doing it. And this to me was the greatest evidence that this is not a cortical process. So patients are scratching in their sleep. It may also be a way, so there we had some other pre-questions about, is this similar to delusions of parasitosis or neurotic excoriation? I, I think, based on the studies, that the difference is going to be, if you have, we were talking about this earlier, if you have delusions of parasitosis, you probably won't scratch at night. I think that's a higher order kind of delusion process. If you have um, excoriation disorder, what we used to call neurotic excoriations, but excoriation disorder, it's more of a compulsion to scratch not so much of a sensory reflex. So it should be that you feel the desire to, 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 to scratch. Uh, if you just are fixated and you just like picking, which is different, it's like, you know, you know it's more like OCD, you want to touch the doorknob, that ha- has a more of a unilateral axis. So it's not so much of a reflex arc, it's more just you're just com- compelled to do something. It's a spectrum, but I, th- I, might, I suspect the, the more compulsive disorders, you're not going to see them scratch at night. I think it's the itch disorders. And I think, and we, we had parago patients in the study, and they were clearly scratching at night. So I think there's bona fide, you know, I say this because there's a lot of confusion because a lot of people see the pictures and they think, oh, these patients have excoriation disorder. Um, I, I don't, there may be some that do, but I don't think most of them do. I think they have true pruritus. Yeah, I, yeah, wholeheartedly agree. I think it will be really important to continue to emphasize the patients can't make this go away on their own just by trying. Um, and I think that having these uh, more targeted therapies in pipeline will kind of help change that thinking over time, hopefully. Um, let's see. There was this- another question earlier about... Um, that a lot of patients on dialysis of PN mm-hmm. and that the medications can be tricky. Uh, oh, yeah, that was a good of, question. Because of safety, yeah. yeah. And, so the, yeah. Sh- the short answer is yes, <laughs> it can be tricky. Um, you do have to be careful with the dosing, and sometimes we'll do little workarounds like I talked about. So we'll do a dose immediately after dialysis so it doesn't get fully cleared by dialysis and um, become unhelpful. But, yeah, you definitely have to renally dose things and that – can sometimes be frustrating because you feel like you're maxing out and not getting all the benefit. But, um, but yeah, there's, there's some, as you talked about it with diphthalocephalin, um, there's some work being done specifically in, um, patients with chronic kidney disease that hopefully will help us, um, understand that patient population, um, more going forward. And of course you have CKD patients that have just pruritus and then a subsegment of those who have, um, traditional paragonodularis with the, um, unique clinical findings as well. But that's the other nice thing about the monoclonal antibodies. Dosing and dialysis is much easier. So, Very good all right. I, th- I think we may be at the end of our time. Yeah, so uh, that concludes. Um, so th- thank you all. Thank um, you so much, everyone, for being here early in the day. Yep. <laughs>